I think if there's somebody in this community who doesn't need an introduction, then I'm, I would say that Seamus uh, probably qualifies for this. But let me very briefly tell those of you who are not familiar with, with his work, what is this all about? So Seamus got his PhD from University of California, Berkeley, and he was working on superfluid helium-3 back in the day. Uh, he then stayed on in Berkeley as a postdoc and, and, and an assistant professor, and, and then became a professor of physics in 2000, full professor in, in 2000. And, and then he had already started working on SDN. Uh, the first papers, I think, came out in 1998 on, on superconductors, uh, design of, of uh, 240 millikelvin SDN, and there's this classic paper, classic paper on quasi particle scattering in a high TC superconductor, Science 99. And of course, there's been many landmark papers since, and, and, and this quasi particle interference technique is, is pretty much pioneered by by Seamus Davis's group. Okay, then he moved on to Cornell, 2003, and has been there ever since. He's nowadays uh, a distinguished professor emeritus there. And, and since last year, he also has an, his main affiliation is, uh, is a professor at Oxford University. And he also holds a professorship at the University College Cork in Ireland. Um, Seamus's research focuses on, on fundamental physics, of electronic, magnetic, and atomic quantum matter. Uh, a speciality is the development of innovative instrumentation to allow direct visualization of characteristic quantum many-body phenomena at the atomic scale. And I think we will hear examples of, of this line of, of progress today. Today, the title of his talk is Atomic Scale Visualization of Electron Pair Fluids and Crystals. And, and with that, Seamus, we will very much look forward to your talk. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, if something goes wrong with my presentation, I hope one of the moderators will interrupt me and let me know. Otherwise, I'm gonna go right ahead. Yeah, will do. Uh, okay. Um, I'm here representing my new program at Oxford, also at University of College Cork, and also at uh, Max Planck in Dresden. It's a pan-European effort. Um, Long may it last. <laughs> um, and I want to talk about visualizing um, electron pairs rather than individual electrons, both fluids and crystals of electron pairs. So what is an electron pair fluid? Well, it's just uh, a different name for a superconductor. Um, Carmen Ligonis discovered superconductivity in 1911 and uh, the the world of physics has not been the same since. It's one of the most important discoveries in the history of physics. But for the properties of metals, um, he found that uh, metals uh, undergo a transition to zero resistance or infinite electrical conductivity. And now we understand they have perfectly dissipationless electrical and electronic characteristics. Um, it's not an obscure state of matter. Right, we live at 300 Kelvin because of biology, but you know, at, at lower temperatures, virtually all uh, elemental materials in the universe, which are conductors, become superconductors. It is the ground state of electronic matter, so it's deeply important and fundamental state. Uh, it used to be said that it was, you know, limited to temperatures near absolute zero. That's also long gone. We have copper and iron-based crystalline superconductors with critical temperatures. Um, up to above 150 Kelvin for the copper-based superconductors. And now we have hydrogen-based high-pressure superconductors with critical temperatures um, certainly above 200 Kelvin. And most recently, lanthanum hydride has been reported to be superconducting at minus 20-something degrees centigrade, which is a warm temperature in Helsinki. So that's definitely a room temperature superconductor. Um, these materials will certainly during the lifetime of the younger members of this audience, revolutionize our electrical and electronic technology. They're <laughs> critically important for power uh, efficiency, capacity, stability, also for density. Uh, per square meter of cable, the amount of power you can deliver with a superconductor is vastly greater than a copper wire. 
they will be very important in the future when we turn completely to renewable power sources and to efficient mechanical power generation from waves and wind. You can't build a high voltage power line from every uh, solar and wind farm. You need a different way to deliver uh, the power to the network and superconductivity is that way. We all know that superconducting quantum technology, namely superconducting quantum computers, are one of the most exciting subjects both in physics and in technology and also in national security at the moment. They're based on superconductivity. The leading ones are based on superconductivity. Next generation high energy physics, the plans are highly dependent on higher fields and higher queues of superconducting devices. And then for medicine and also for future fusion power reactors, um, superconductivity is planned to be critical. Okay. Superconductors that we work with now emerge from metals. So let's take the simplest possible model of a metal. It's an electronic Fermi liquid. So the uh, energy and non-relativistic, so the energy momentum relationship is P squared over 2M. There's the energy momentum relationship. Electrons are in a crystal, so the famous band gaps open. And you know, if there's an odd number of free electrons per unit cell, then it's degenerate. The, all the states fill up to the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy defines an energy and also a momentum, the Fermi momentum. This beautiful state of matter with which we're all familiar actually is completely unstable. It, it is not the ground state at zero temperature for any metal that we're aware of uh, because uh, electrons of opposite momentum and opposite spin uh, for infinitely weak interactions at low enough temperature will always bind together to make a two electron state, the Cooper pair. Um, and then those Cooper pairs will condense to make a new macroscopic quantum state of matter. Cooper pair condensate, or the, AKA superconductor. The macroscopic wave function for the Cooper pair is a product state over all possible pairs uh, of electrons with some quantum coherence factors. And the order parameter for the superconductor is the average value over all of those paired states. It's the average of the pair density. Um, I'm a superfluid guy, so I call this the superfluid density. Now, when this happens, the original electronic structure changes drastically. It's not a perturbation. So all the states crossing the chemical potential disappear. An energy gap delta opens, and a new many-body state appears effectively at zero chemical potential. And now we have two types of electronic degrees of freedom. One, uh, one type are the quasiparticles. They're still, you know, de Broglie electron-like eigenstates. They have well-defined spin, well-defined momentum, and it's somewhat disagreed uh, whether they have well-defined charge. That's an outstanding question of physics. Um, but these guys are the excited states. The true ground state is the fluid of pairs, okay? And it's rarely examined directly on its own behalf. Okay, so now let me tell you about um, crystals of, of these electron pairs. So this state described here is a fluid. It's translationally invariant. It has no exotic real space properties. But uh, crystals of electron pairs are also possible. Um, imagine splitting the Fermi surface such that the wave vector of spin up and the wave vector of spin down are different, right? Now, when you make the Cooper pair, you bind two objects whose momenta is not opposite, so the pair has its own momentum. When you condense the pairs, you get an order parameter which has a finite momentum. In quantum mechanics, an object with momentum has a wavelength. So when you form this state, it has a real space periodicity, two pi over the wave vector. This period, so you, you, the prediction, this is the Fulda, Feller, Larkin, or Chinnikov state, should modulate the pairing uh, condensate or the, the pair field of the superconductor periodically in space. And now for practical reasons, people, you know, imaging these pair modulations or, or detecting them at all has been impossible for the last 50 or 60 years. So people often focused on a derivative effect, which is the charge modulation. So if this pair modulation appears, a, a, a charge modulation, which might be minuscule, but shouldn't be zero will appear. And in this particular FFLO state, the charge modulation should have twice the wave vector of the pair modulation. Okay, now there's uh, another case. So this is case one, FFLO. There's another case, case two. 
suppose you have a material which has a charge density rate in its normal state. There are many uh, transition metal dichalcogenides that are robust pair density wave materials. In them, the periodic um, arrangement of the atoms alters uh, the, the unit cell size. Let's say in this example, the unit cell size has doubled. So that means that the Brion zone has halved. And along with the altering of the periodicity of the crystal, there is a periodic modulation of the charge density, the free charge density, which is static. That's a charge density wave state. If you take a material with that state and it's also superconducting, so it also supports superconductivity, then you can use ginsburg landau theory. If I write the ginsburg landau free energy for the superconductor plus the charge density wave, there's another order I could write down, which is a pair density wave, a modulating uh, energy gap of the superfluid. And they couple together to first order. This is a very powerful statement. Many things only couple in ginsburg landau to second order. But charge density wave, superconductor, and pair density wave couple to first order in ginsburg landau So if you have a superconductor and a charge density wave, you should get a robust pair density wave. And in this case, the pair wave vector is the same as the charge wave vector. And in theory, this is ginsburg landau theory. This has been known since the early 1960s, but never detected. And neither had the FFLO state ever been detected directly. Okay. And last but not least, advanced modern physics, if you take a doped correlated insulator, a doped mod insulator, it has a real space Hamiltonian, which is more complicated. Okay, it has strong spin interaction between adjacent spins, that's the exchange or super exchange energy. And if you dope it with holes, then hopping becomes possible at this hopping rate. If you solve this equation, can't be solved analytically even today, but if you solve it numerically, one of the solutions is a pair density wave where the pair field modulates in space with a wave vector. The wave vector is set by the number of holes that you put in the insulator, which is very interesting. So this also has been predicted for several decades. And in this case, we could also use Ginsberg-Landau, the same coupling Ginsberg-Landau term that links charge, superconductor, and pair density wave. Here, it, if you have a superconductor and a pair density wave, it links these two terms to produce a charge density wave. So in this case, you should, you should get a charge modulation with the same wave vector as the pair density wave. Okay, so this is a summary of these theoretical predictions, FFLO, CDW, and doped mod insulator, they should all produce what are what I call charge crystal, uh, electron pair crystals. And, you know, the challenge for experimentalists, which has only been uh, emerging over the last five years, has been to verify these ideas directly by direct visualization of the pair of the electron pair crystal. And that was one of our major motivations for the technological development that uh, I'm going to talk about today. So the tool we now use is scanned Josephson tunneling microscopy. So let me step back for a second. So um, we, we use uh, fairly conventional uh, spectroscopic imaging STM, the IDV mapping, but we do it in an ultra low vibration laboratory. Typically we have reinforced underground uh, concrete vault the outer lab. It's got acoustic isolation. Then we have a reinforced inner lab. This is like a, a recording studio style. Um, uh, it, it, uh, damps it damps the acoustic penetration from the outside, but also we damp the vibrations by having the whole inner lab uh, be on six massive air springs. And then inside we have an ultra low vibration cryostat and inside the cryostat we have a low temperature refrigerator. Now they go down into the tens of millikelvin range. And inside the refrigerator down here, we have the spectroscopic STM. Now, why do we have all this vibration isolation? There are many experts, uh, I hopefully, listening to this presentation, and they know that um, modern STMs wouldn't really need all of this stuff in order to perform properly. And the reason is not more spatial resolution. It's signal to noise. So when we're mapping the differential conductance, uh, DIDV versus V, as a function of a location, let's say with atomic resolution, we usually have about 50 pixels inside each unit cell. Then in a reasonable field of view, we have a very large number of pixels at which we wish to, to measure the IDV. 
And we want to measure the IDV typically with fidelity, uh, maybe a few parts in a thousand. So, you know, here's lithium iron arsenide in this field of view. We map the IDV as a function of location and energy. So here's a movie containing the data set. Okay. So it looks like it works. So why all the expense of low vibration isolation? That's for speed, okay? When we originally introduced these ideas in the late 90s, it would take three months to take this movie with the same signal to noise. Um, by reducing the vibrations, you reduce uh, the current fluctuations, so you can increase the bandwidth, so you can do the experiment more rapidly. So now we could do this experiment here in an hour or two today, instead of in several months. So all the vibration isolation is to achieve speed of measurement and enhance signal to noise at a shorter time. Okay, so this is an image of the quasiparticles in this superconductor, lithium iron arsenide, and as many of you know, real images of the electronic structure of real materials usually look horrible. That's because they are not theorists' fantasies, they are actually real materials full of all kinds of impurity atoms and defects and so on. But if you take the Fourier transform of this very movie, it looks like this. It's got three bands, one, two, three, one, two, three. And because of the way scattering interference and Fourier analysis works, you can use the Fourier analysis to see the contours in momentum space of the electronic eigenstates. This is 2KF of the main Fermi surface of this compound. So quasiparticle scattering interference allows us to see those quasiparticles very clearly. So now the point I was making earlier is that by using these techniques, one can visualize the electronic structure of these electronics excited states of a superconductor. And it's a tremendously powerful and generous and exciting and fun technique. There's an enormous number of things you can do by quasiparticle visualization. However, people began to realize, what about visualizing the electron pair fluid? Does it contain new physics? Does it contain new secrets uh, of quantum matter that for which we need direct visualization? So to visualize the electron pair fluid, instead of using a single electron, um, a metal tip which has single electron eigenstates, you want to use a superconducting tip whose only eigenstates are pairs. Then the current somehow in theory would be related to the, to the density of pairs and you could visualize the pair density. At least as a cartoon, that's the concept of scan and microscopy. Superconducting tip, pair visualization. Okay, let's look at the equations. Take two superconductors, each of which has a macroscopic quantum wave function. And I'll allow the two order parameters to have the same magnitude. Each has a quantum phase breaking gauge symmetry and the phase difference theta is the difference between these two phases. Now, superconductors can have a voltage difference. The voltage difference obviously is the difference between the voltage of these two samples and a pair current can flow. Here is the famous Josephson current voltage relationship of a Josephson junction. At zero voltage, if you have an external current source, you can deliver current through this junction with no dissipation until you reach the critical current. And then if you deliver more current, you'll jump onto the voltage branch. So if you're at this current, all that happens is that the phase adjusts itself to satisfy the Josephson equation. Whereas if you're at this current, what happens is that the phase evolves in time to satisfy the second Josephson equation that phi dot is two EV. So of course, everyone knows this very well. Um, you can integrate this equation and find the energy stored in the junction as a function of the phase difference. It goes as one minus cosine phase difference. And the scale is important for scan Josephson microscopy. The scale of the Josephson energy linking these two superconductors and allowing the Josephson tunneling is the Josephson current times h bar over two e. This is called the Josephson energy. And the maximum Josephson energy here is at uh, phase difference pi. Okay, now let's think of STM. You have a superconducting sample and a superconducting tip. Here's the superconducting macroscopic wave function in the sample. Here's the superconducting wave function in the tip. So uh, if I consider Josephson tunneling uh, from one superconductor to the other, each contains pairs, um, there's a 
vacuum gap here. So the pair amplitude decays exponentially in the vacuum gap. And according to Josephson, the current density of this junction should go as a sign of the difference of the phases. So far, so good. Now, if you solve the Tunbing equation, you find that the current density, the number of pairs per second per square meter, goes as some constants. It decays exponentially in the thickness of the tunnel barrier, of course, with some thickness scale, which goes as the work functions. And then it's proportional to the amplitude of the two wave functions, rho s of the sample and rho s of the tip. Now, this term here is actually one over the normal junction resistance, right? As this tunneling decays uh, more rapidly, right? As this number gets smaller, it's the same as this junction resistance getting bigger. So if I multiply up by the junction resistance, I can, and uh, by the cross-sectional area of the junction, I can get Josephson critical current times junction resistance is proportional to the product of the two order parameters, the square root of the two superfluid densities. And for scan Josephson microscopy, this is the key equation. It means if I measure the Josephson current squared by the junction resistance squared, and if the tip uh, superfluid density is constant, then I can get an image of the content of the sample superfluid density. That's the objective. Now, all is not, mother nature has been very generous here, but she still reserves her um, uh, some secrets. So if you calculate the value of this function, let's say for uh, niobium, this energy gap is in the range of one millivolt. Uh, so the, the value of I naught times Rn is just a millivolt divided by electron volt. It's about 1.5 millivolts. But typically an STM junction here is a giga ohm. So now if I divide down by a giga ohm, I'll get that the Josephson current is a few picoamps. Okay, if the Josephson current is picoamps, the Josephson energy is nano electron volts and if I can, what is that in a temperature? It's 30 microkelvin. So according to this whole analysis here, you'd have to build a scan Josephson microscope to operate, let's say, at 10 microkelvin in order to measure the Josephson critical current directly. And for that reason, this has been, you know, technological development in this field has been slow and difficult. And no one has built any 30 microkelvin microscopes yet. Now we're safe. Mother Nature has some secrets though. Um, there is a way out. If you consider the Josephson energy as a function of phase, um, including the capacitance, resistance, critical current, and external bias, I don't have time to explain this, but it's, this is the equation for the evolution of the Josephson phase as a function um, of, well, for a device with these characteristics, the phase dynamics equation looks like this. Okay. And this is the capacitance of the junction, this is the resistance of the junction, this is the critical current, and this is the external bias. Now, if, if the thermal energy was very small, then the phase will be fixed. And according to whatever the phase value is, there'll be a Josephson current, no problem. But suppose the thermal energy is enormous compared to the Josephson energy, which is the limit we're in then there could still be a Josephson current provided the average value of the sine of theta. This is the distribution of all possible phases in our fluctuating situation. Provided the average value of this function is not zero, then there can be a pair current. So Ivanchenko and Zilberman solved that problem in 1969. Even when KT is much bigger than the Josephson energy and if C goes to zero, this average doesn't go to zero. There's an average electric electron pair current, uh, which goes as the Josephson current squared. It goes as the voltage developed across the junction. The voltage appears because the phase is shifting randomly up and down this junction. And it goes as the external, the electromagnetic impedance of the environment. So this function looks like that. Jo's pair current has a negative maximum, goes through zero, a positive maximum. As a function of voltage across the Josephson junction, and now, you know, the voltages are in the microvolt range. If I take the derivative of this function, I can find the maximum pair current. It goes as the Josephson current squared and some constants. So the value of this observable here goes as the Josephson critical current squared. And finally, if I take the derivative of this, uh, sorry, if I take the maximum of this function, I get this. If I take the derivative of this function here and set the Josephson, set the bias voltage to zero, then I can find that there's a peak in the derivative at this point. We call that G0. It's the electron pair conductance at zero bias. 
And that electron pair conductance also goes as the maximum of the Josephson current, which go, uh, as the maximum of the pair current, which goes as the Josephson current squared. Okay, that's the end of the theory. From, this, from these two equations, and I already told you that the superfluid density goes as the critical current squared times the junction resistance squared. Well, you could measure the superfluid density by measuring the current maximum as a function of location and knowing the junction resistance or by measuring the uh, zero bias maximum as a function of location and, and seeing the Josephson resistance uh, and measuring the uh, junction resistance. And these two techniques, as Bob Dine showed, should work at much higher temperatures. All right, let's attempt to use them. First of all, transition metal dicalcogenides. These are the poster child of condensed matter physics at the moment. Everybody loves these materials. If I take a charge density wave compound, and there are many TMDs which contain a charge density wave. This is a topographic image of CDW. And if it's also a superconductor, then from ginzburg landau theory, it should have a pair density wave. So let's search for the pair density wave. We're at uh, 280 millikelvin. Uh, this is niobium diselenide. We're using a niobium di tip, niobium tip, and clearly it has subatomic resolution. There are various tricks involved in preparing the tip, but you know, here's the DIDV spectrum and its, ener its apparent energy gap is two millivolts. That's because it's the convolution of the energy gap in the tip and the energy gap in the sample. Here's the high voltage spectrum. Out here is the charge density wave. Down here near a millivolt is the gap edge. If we go down to microvolts, we see that there is a peak in the pair tunneling from tip to sample. It's way down here. And if we take the derivative, and these are data, if we take the derivative, we can see there's a peak in the conductance at zero bias within about 10 microvolts of zero bias. So what these spectra mean is if you could map this surface with enough uh, pixels, you should be able to visualize the pair, the superfluid density in this compound. Okay, so here's a map of the IDV in this field of view um, at minus 20 millivolts. This is the charge density wave. Now here's a map of the IDV, uh, one over the IDV, which is the normal state junction resistance at high voltage, it's at about five millivolts. And we've checked in the normal and superconducting state, it's the same. This is a map of the normal state junction resistance. And it's in the same field of view. Now, now we go down from tens of millivolts to tens of microvolts and map the pair tunneling conductance near zero bias with atomic resolution. I think this is the first time this has been done. Um, oh no, that's not true. Milan Allen has done this for iron selenide, but for uh, transition metal dicalcogenides, this is the first time. So now we have the pair map and the junction map. The superfluid density is supposed to be the product of this guy by that guy squared, and here is that product. So now we have an image of the superfluid density at millikelvin temperatures with atomic resolution. So here's a simultaneous field of view image of the, of the high voltage near 20 millivolts and of the very low voltage near 20 microvolts. Uh, sorry, and this is multiplied by Rn squared. So this is the superfluid density and this is actually the charge density. If I take the Fourier transform, I see the Bragg peaks of the lattice. If I tr take the Fourier transform of the superfluid density, I see the Bragg peaks of the lattice. That's actually very interesting. Uh, furthermore, there's six more peaks at lower Q. And these six peaks here are the charge density modulation, which you can see with your own eyes here, charge density wave. And these six peaks are the pair density wave, which you can see if you look carefully modulating in this direction. So now we see pair density, superfluid density modulation with atomic resolution, which is really fascinating. You can remove the Bragg peaks by Fourier filtering. So you just push the crystal information into the background and look at the charge density wave and the pair density wave simultaneously. This one has an order parameter, which is a scalar field of charge density. This one has an order parameter, which is a super pair modulation, which also breaks gauge symmetry. And they're in the same field of view. All the experts can look at these two images and see that they don't look the same. And that came as a big surprise to us. Ginsburg Landau theory would somehow, people thought, would have predicted that the pair density wave should look like the charge density wave, but it doesn't. So th that was extremely interesting. 
But before I come on to that, we should take a check of the Ginsburg-Landau theory. So as most of you know, if you apply a magnetic field to a superconductor, and this is a picture of niobium diselenide, then uh, the magnetic field punches through the superconductor in quantized vortices within which the superfluid or the parameter goes to zero. Now, this is a quasiparticle. This is like Harald Hess's famous picture of the quasiparticles surrounding the vortex core. But if you could image the superfluid density, um, as Hermann Sudero did for the first time, the superfluid density should drop down to zero inside the vortex core. And it does. This is an image of the superfluid density in a niobium diselenide vortex core, and the superfluid density drops smoothly down from its external value down to zero, as predicted. If you look carefully, you can see these wiggles. They're the pair density wave. So now I can take this image and just extract the pair density wave. It looks like this. And the amplitude of the pair density wave, it also drops smoothly down to zero into the vortex core, as it should. That's what Ginsburg-Landau predicts. If the superconducting order parameter drops to zero, then the free energy density doesn't get any gain by having the pair density order parameter. So it should drop to zero linearly with the superfluid order parameter. And it, it does exactly as predicted. So what this shows is that the PDW state couples linearly to the superconductor and that indeed it is being induced by the existence of the superconductivity. So that's a nice double check. Now back to the mystery of why does the pair density wave not look the same as the simultaneous, uh, sorry, why does the charge density wave not look the same as the simultaneous pair density? wave? We were scratching our heads. So let's make it a simpler problem. We can extract, so this is actually three pair density waves with three difference. This is three charge density waves and this is three pair density waves. So let's just extract one of them so it's easier to see and measure its amplitude we know it's periodicity. The two Q vectors are the same. By the way, that also is predicted by ginsburg landau And what is obviously different is the spatial phase of these two density waves. So let's measure what is the spatial phase of these two density waves. It looks like this. So in this field of view, there's a modulation with this wave vector. I'm not showing the modulation. Uh, but the modulation has an additional term, a spatial phase, which looks like this. The spatial phase can be anywhere between zero and two pi. And these are uh, locking um, pin, these are locking um, pinning of a CDW domain, all of the same phase, spatial phase to the crystal. That's the famous Macmillan locking effect. Now here's an image of the phase of the pair density wave and we've adjusted the color scale. So you can see the domains are the same, right? This is a domain of the charge density wave. This is a domain of the pair density wave but they're the same domain. So this lock-in has locked in this order parameter. Okay, that's cool. But to make this work, I had to subtract a phase of two pi. If I subtract the phase uh, of the modulation here, minus the phase of the modulation here, everywhere, it comes out to be two pi, sorry, not two pi, two pi over three, two pi over three. The pair density wave phase and the charge density wave phase are different by a very strict phase difference of two pi over three. And we can do that for all the modulations. They're all different by two pi over three. So in real space, what that actually means, you can work through the mathematics, but a cartoon is easier to understand. If I show you where the atoms are in the crystal, these are niobium atoms, let's say, they're periodic, one unit cell of the crystal. Then the charge density wave is periodic, three unit cells of the crystal between here and here. So is the pair density wave between here and here. But the spatial phase of the pair density wave is slipped from the charge density wave by one unit cell. So the, spatial, the maximum of the pair density wave is shifted from the charge density wave by one unit cell. We don't know the microscopic explanation for this. It probably has to do with quantum interference um, of Cooper pair tunneling. Uh, but we are working on the theory of that effect right now to try and understand why this happens. I mean, don't forget, when you inject a Cooper pair, you're not injecting one electron at one location. You're injecting two electrons, and they were separated by the coherence length of the Cooper pair, where they came from and where they're going to. So there's an additional spatial structure involved in tunneling Cooper pairs. And now we are attempting to understand how that works. Okay. Uh, 
let me move on. So, um, so that's the status of our understanding of pair density wave, um, induced pair density waves in transition metal dicalcogenides. For those of you who are, you know, not focused on the particular issues I raised here, I can point to a much bigger issue, which is that there are dozens, in fact, there are more than 60 transition metal dicalcogenides, which are both CDW and superconductors of different types, plus their intercalates. So what this means is that there's a whole new universe for visualizing pair field physics in the TMWs. You'll be able to visualize the PDWs, their domains, their defects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in this whole new universe of quantum many body physics, which is revealed by scan Joseph's and tunneling microscopy. So in that sense, we think that uh, SJTM on TMDs indicates an abundant new subfield of superconducting physics. All right, well, let's look at the time here. Good, excellent. Now I'm gonna change gears, not in terms of technology, but in terms of the concepts to be discussed. Because now I'd like to discuss for the remaining 10 minutes, let's say, uh, Josephson tunneling to cuprate superconductors. Now the CO2 uh, layer of these compounds is actually a MOT insulator. You have copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen. The uh, Coulomb energy, the Hubbard energy to doubly occupy the copper site is three electron volts. And you're in a 3D9 state, so there's only one electron available per copper site. And you can't doubly occupy the site. So it becomes a charge transfer MOT insulator that 3D9 electrons get frozen on the copper sites. If you could remove some of those electrons, the hopping rate is very high. It's actually 400 millivolts. So that would be a metal with a wide bandwidth. But because of the Coulomb energy, it's actually an insulator. And because of second order hopping, super exchange, uh, the super exchange energy is enormously high. This is one of the strongest uh, spin half antiferromagnets in nature. So um, undoped CO2 is a strong antifer super exchange dri driven antiferromagnetic mod insulator. Now, if you dope it with holes, you have to consider the following fact. The oxygen 2p6 orbitals in, in, are in, in energetic terms, their p orbitals are between the lower d and the upper d orbital of the 3d9 state. So when the bands are formed, the oxygen band is in between the two copper bands. So that means when you dope this compound with holes, you're removing the highest energy electron, you're putting a hole into the oxygen band. So in real space, you're injecting a hole at this site or removing an electron at this site. And by doing so, you make a new quantum mechanical object. I just show it here as a green oval. Although there are many people who believe they understand what this object is, I'm not one of them. I think this is a mystery of nature to understand what this quantum mechanical object is um, created by hole doping the P-band of the CO2 MOT insulator. In any case, when you create this object, uh, now let's imagine putting more and more and more holes into this plane, you get this phase. Temperature, hole density, so here would be just 1% of holes, here's 10%, here's 25%. At just 2 or 3% of hole density of this object, it completely destroys the very robust antiferromagnet, but it doesn't destroy the super exchange, the super exchange remains. Um, and as you increase the hole density, the robust superconductivity appears. We actually understand the superconductivity very well. We understand the antiferromagnet very, very well. What we don't understand is the intervening phase, the pseudogap phase. And now for decades, it has been proposed that this phase is a hole dope spin liquid. So why would that be? Well, we dope in the holes, there's no doubt about that. But to minimize the magnetic energy, the super exchange energy was proposed by Phil Anderson to form spin singlets. Um, those spin singlets would you know, have spin zero and all the super exchange energy could be used up in that process. And so energetically, it makes very good sense that there could be a fluid of spin singlets with a small number of doped holes. And you know, many of the leading theorists, condensed matter theorists of now more than one generation have hypothesized this state of matter. So it's a beautiful hypothesis. Uh, but there is 
one fly, or in fact, there are hundreds of flies in this ointment, and that's because experiment shows that this phase breaks translational and rotational symmetry. It's not a liquid with no broken symmetries. It's a broken symmetry state. So, you know, that produced some kind of cognitive dissonance for a while between these colleagues and these colleagues, but there is a way out. It could be that the pseudo gap is a, a whole dope spin liquid, but it's one that spontaneously breaks translational and rotational symmetry. There's no reason why a whole dope spin liquid can't spontaneously break symmetry. So the question is, what state of a whole dope spin liquid would break translational and rotational symmetry? Well, we have numerically solvable strong coupling theories. This is the TJ model. It's derived from the Hubbard model by setting the Coulomb energy to infinity. You can solve this model numerically. And when you do in this parameter range, when you do so, you get a strong coupling pair density wave state. Many different theory groups using many different techniques over almost, um, well, more than 20 years, depending on when you start counting, have found that the ground state of this Hamiltonian for, C, for the parameters of CuO2 in this doping range contains a pair density wave. It's something where the pair field modulates in space, the spin density modulates in space, the charge density modulates in space at twice the wave vector, and the magnitude of the pair density modulates in space. The pair density modulates like this, the magnitude of the pair density modulates like that. These are all theoretical predictions that strong coupling theory should produce a pair density wave in the cuprates. We made a cartoon to help you understand what we're looking at. This is a very exotic state. It's a D wave compound. So you have D wave Cooper pairs and over eight unit cells, they're going to, their amplitude will pass through zero. The zero is here. It'll change sign. So for D wave changing sign means rotating through 90 degrees. And then another half cycle, it'll pass through zero and it'll change back again. So in eight unit cells, the pair field will modulate maximum, negative maximum, positive maximum. The spin density will modulate. And if I showed you the charge, the charge density would modulate uh, maximum, maximum, maximum. We want to search for this object. Um, the reason, this, this is all a very recent proposal. It, there was a meeting at KITP in uh, 2015, uh, mostly theorists, but I happened to be hanging around there. And the theory colleagues were urging us very strongly to answer the question, does a pair density wave exist in the pseudo gap phase of the cuprates? Now think of the strategic issue there, you know, why did they have to ask that question just five years ago? It's because the technology to detect a pair density wave did not exist. There was no definitive way to find a pair density wave. So starting around 2015, we began to bang on that problem. For the cube rates, CuO2, they're D wave superconductors. We had to make a D wave high temperature superconducting tip. The D wave is to match the symmetry of the Cooper pairs. The high temperature superconducting tip is to get enough uh, pair current um, at a reasonable temperature um, under reasonable junction conditions. So we figured out how to pick up a piece of the high TC superconductor onto our tungsten tip and still retain atomic resolution. These are images with the high TC tip. And this is a different high TC tip. So we have a fairly reliable recipe for doing this. And you can see that it's a high TC tip. Look at the energy scale here. This is 100 millivolts four delta, uh, you know, two delta from the sample and two delta from the tip is 100 millivolts. So delta in the tip is 25 millivolts. So now we have the superconducting tip we need for, for a scan Josephson microscope. Uh, next thing we need is uh, to see the Josephson current. Well, if we push our high TC tip in, increasing, decreasing the junction resistance, we see the um, we see the pair current, and now you see the voltages are in the microvolt range. We see the pair current appearing steadily. And once we get the junction resistance into the 10 mega ohm range, then we have a sharp maximum in the pair current. I told you the superfluid density goes as the, mac the value of the maximum in the pair current times the junction resistance squared. That's because the maximum in the pair current goes as the Josephson current squared. Okay, so now at 50 millikelvin, we have the pair current maximum with the D wave tip. 
for the experts here were the parameters of the experiment. We have sub nanometer resolution, SJTM with 25 millivolt gap, 50 millikelvin operating temperature. That was hard. And the, jun the junction resistance was 10 mega ohms for the experts in the audience. They know that was also extremely hard. Uh, but nevertheless, this experiment worked. So we started imaging the Josephson, the maximum of the pair current as a function of location. So here, 75 nanometer square, a pretty large field of view, but we do have atomic resolution. If you look carefully, we can see the bismuth atoms on the surface. We measure the maximum of the pair current. It looks like this. I'm pretty sure this is one, if not the first image of the cuprate pair condensate uh, ever taken. And we were amazed and shocked when we saw it because you can see it contains a lot of uh, spatial information. This is 75 nanometers, but on that scale, there's a lot of activity. Um, so now we, we, we wanted to propose that this is an image of the electron pair condensate of a high TC superconductor. Well, there was some skeptic, as you can imagine, in that field, there was some skepticism and that's putting it politely. There was a lot of skepticism. <laughs> So we had to validate, is this actually an image of the pair field, of the pair density? Well, because this is a mature field, shall we say, there are other things we know about it. For example, if you put a zinc atom on the copper side, we know from muon spin rotation that it completely destroys the superfluid within one nanometer of the zinc atom. You know, that's been known for decades. It's a very well-established fact. It even has a, a name. It's called a Swiss cheese model. The zinc atom on the copper site destroys the pairing and produces a hole in the superfluid density. So we asked our colleague Isaki Sen to put zinc atoms on the copper site. And we can find them by uh, quasiparticle tunneling spectroscopy. So in this field of view, every place where you see a black dot, there is a peak in the IDV telling us. And we can even see them if we're careful. We can see that there is a zinc resonance here. There's a, a zinc atom at each of these sites. This is the simultaneous energy of the maximum pair current. And you can see wherever there's a zinc atom in the quasiparticle current, there's a zero in the pair current. Here's two zincs, here's two zeros. Here's another zinc, here's another zero. Correspondence is excellent. So what this shows is that this image is an image of the pair density. All right, let's stipulate to that. Scan Josephson imaging of the superfluid density of high TC superconductor. Well, now the experts in the audience can look at this image and they can see that it's actually modulating and it's modulating in two directions. So if I take the Fourier transform, I see four sharp peaks. Their Q vector is uh, a quarter of two pi over a naught, or if you're a real space person like myself, they have a four unit cell periodicity. So this mother nature was incre incredibly generous to us here. On the first try, we found the pair density. Not well, it took years to develop the technology, but on the first successful experiments, we found the pair density wave in the cuprates. We were thrilled. It was a really delightful situation. Okay, now we got to think about what does this mean? We have a superconducting tip, D wave, and it's imaging the high temperature superconductor D wave and we're measuring the magnitude of the Josephson current. That's important. If you go back to the Josephson equation, it, it doesn't measure the signed value of the Josephson current. It measures the magnitude of the Josephson current. So we're measuring the pair density and it's modulating with four unit cell periodicity. We guessed, but we couldn't prove that this is because the pair field was modulating with eight unit cell periodicity. Okay, now to test this idea, um, our colleague in Brookhaven, our collaborator in Brookhaven, Fujita-san, was able to use single particle, quasi-particle tunneling to measure the energy gap and find that it was modulating. This is the peak or quasi-particle peak, and this is the energy scale. The energy gap is modulating. Here's the Fourier transform of an image of the energy gap. It has a sharp peak at one over eight or periodicity eight unit cells. So now we have also found this piece of the effect most satisfactorily using the same technology. And last but not least, there should be a quasiparticle density modulation at the wave vector of the pair density wave and at actually at twice the wave vector of the pair density wave. And we were able to find that Steve Edkins and Mohammed Hamidian found that in the vortex cores in 2019. So, okay, 
our colleagues uh, five years ago asked us, you know, does a pair density wave state exist in the underdoped cuprates? And now we can definitively say, yes, it does, without the slightest doubt. We're very confident that there is a pair density wave in the underdoped cuprates by direct observation. And we predict it'll be found in more cuprates using the same technology. So that's great, super, a step in the right direction. Now, here's the 64, it used to be called the $64 million question, but now it's called the $64 billion question <laughs> due to inflation. Um, is the pseudo gap phase of the cuprates a pair density wave? Well, we don't have a definitive answer to that. So let me tell you the status of that question. A pair density wave has a single particle spectrum, which is gapped um, near the zone phase of the Brion zone and has an arc of metallic states in the middle of the Brion zone. Well, the cuprates have that single particle spectrum. That's been known for 25 years. But it's a property of a pair density wave model. Uh, the spectral function of pair density wave has been worked out. And the spectral function for a monolayer underdoped cuprates is highly consistent. Um, uh, this is Ziek Shen's work. And Patrick Lee first pointed this out. Uh, Underdot cuprates have quantum oscillations whose explanation has been very mysterious. But Mike Norman showed that if the broken symmetry state is a pair density wave, you get the quantum oscillations with the correct frequency for the cuprates. And finally, pair density wave should break translational and rotational symmetry both for the pair field and for the single electrons. That's what we have contributed to this story. So there's a great deal of evidence not inconsistent with the idea that the, the pseudo gap is a pair density wave. But let me not oversell this in a, well, let me, let me not oversell this. The problem with this argument is that a pair density wave is a superconductor. It breaks great gauge symmetry. And the pseudo gap phase is not a superconductor. It's resistive to transport. So still, the outstanding question is, somehow could this be a phase incoherent pair density wave? That's at the frontier of research right now. We do not know the answer, but it's a focus of our studies. Okay, that's the last piece of physics I wanted to talk about. I hope I've shown you that uh, by using scan Josephson tunneling microscopy, there really is a, a new universe in condensed matter physics for visualizing electron pair fluids and crystals. Um, Hermann Sudero showed how to visualize the pair field uh, in vortex core. Mohamed Hamidian, how to visualize the pair field in cuprates. Milan Allen, how to visualize the pair field in iron superconductors. And Zhaolong Liu, how to visualize the pair field in transition metal dicalcogenides. So, you know, the things you would like to visualize can be visualized. We have demonstrated that. How about the theory? Well, the CDW plus superconductivity theory, we have demonstrated that that's correct. The doped mod insulator theory, we believe we have demonstrated that that's correct. How about FFLO? Well, the thing about FFLO is that uh, colleagues rarely put in the numbers. If you want to get a one nanometer resolution pair density wave in FFLO uh, for a free electron band structure, you need a magnetic field between 1,000 and 10,000 Tesla. So FFLO for trivial bands is still far out of reach. But given the capabilities here, we hope to address this issue soon by using other classes of materials. So the things to be seen do exist and can be seen. And the theories to be tested indeed can be tested. So with that conclusion, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Siamo, for this uh, wonderful talk and for showing us all the very interesting possibilities with this uh, scanning Josephson STM. So now we have time for some questions. So uh, you can either write your question in the chat or uh, raise your hand with the, in the button that you can see on the uh, participants option. So yeah, there's one question by Sander. Sander, please go ahead. Um. First of all, thank you for a beautiful talk, uh, Seamus. This is very insightful um, and a very promising field. Now, in the first part of your talk, we discussed the uh, dicacogenides. Yeah. You showed at some point uh, next to each other uh, an image of the, uh, the charge density, uh, uh, density of states, and the, the 
the superconducting fluid density of states. Correct. We showed that they were shifted by a phase two pi over three. Yeah. Uh, so it would lag, one would lag to the other by one unit cell. But Correct. This is, I, if I understand correctly, this is uh, a matter of, you know, you, you, it either lags or it is ahead by uh, one unit cell. That's correct. Uh, if you can rotate the, 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 the scan frame. So uh, if you have a two-dimensional surface, you have a certain direction it, in which it lags. How consistent is that direction? Does it match with the crystalline axis? And, and how, you know, uh, how... And what is the origin for this? Do okay. you have any idea? Good. Let, let me share my screen again, okay? Those are yeah. excellent questions, and I know they're excellent because I don't know the answer, but <laughs> that's okay. Let's go back here, pair the uh, transition metal dicalcogenides here. Um, so if if we look if we look at the uh, if we look at the Fourier transform, um, you know, this is the Q vector of the pair density wave, uh, sorry, of the charge density wave. And this is the Q vector of the pair density wave. They're virtually identical, yeah. both in magnitude and direction. So that means uh, whenever the one dimensional charge density wave is traveling along one axis, uh, the pair density wave is traveling along the identical axis. They're tightly locked to each other. So, so, and the magnitudes of the two Q vectors are indistinguishable from each other inside a domain where there's no facelift, okay? Uh, now, uh, you know, what microscopic mechanism would shift the pair fluid from the charge fluid? Well, you could, I could guess, I said in my preprint that it's Coulomb interactions, uh, but I don't have any microscopic uh, theory to validate a hypothesis like that. And also, why would Coulomb interactions move it by exactly one unit set? So that, you know, it, that remains to be seen. Um, but, but the other thing to remember is that um, Fourier transform STM, upon which we're depending here, is not equivalent for single electrons and for pairs. When you're tunneling pairs, you're tunneling an object which has its own structure factor. Okay, and so the full understanding of what it means to do scan Josephson, including the structure factor of the Cooper pair, is not worked out. And that might be the reason why these images have these properties. We, we really don't know the answer to that question. Right, but, but if you would scan a, a far distance away, like a yeah. several microns, yeah. would you find the phase shift in the same direction or does that, does that vary? So there are, as you said, there are two possibilities and we have e equal numbers of both possibilities. I see. So, okay. so it's in the same direction, but not in the same vectorial direction. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, Robert, please go ahead. Uh, yes. Hello. Is the microphone working? Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. Absolutely beautiful data. Um, as one thing, uh, Seamus, that I'd really like to hear your opinion on that here discussed a lot. So what you are looking at uh, in all of this data in the end is still the ICRN product, if I understood you correctly. Correct. And that, of course, comes uh, out of the Ambigakwa Baratov theory, which is rather specific for, for BCS superconductors. And of course, now you're looking at something that is very much not a BCS superconductor. So what, what issues do you see in, in that area and how, how applicable, basically, do you think the theory really is? Very good. And, so that is an excellent question. Um, so for the, I mean, we're pretty confident that superconductivity, although it's a two or maybe even three band superconductor in niobium diselenide is a BCS superconductor. The coherence length is 75 angstroms um, and uh, term, bulk thermodynamic characteristics indicate that it's BCS. So here, um, I think the Ambergarkar Baratov analysis of the Josephson tunneling STM is valid, absolutely. Um, now here, scanning, scan, tunneling to the cube rates, that's a whole different universe, right? So, so when we were able to show these uh, pair tunneling images, yeah, so let's talk about what this means. This, this is not, what this is, is an image of the probability, the maximum probability to inject a pair, uh, a Cooper, a D-wave Cooper pair from Bisco to Bisco. And, you know, colleagues were rightly skeptical. Are you really sure that this is an image of the density of the pairs in the material? And that's why we did this zinc experiment, right? We know independently that the zinc destroys the pair density. 
um, if you look at the supplementaries of this paper, there is a statistical analysis of how the uh, maximum pair current diminishes into the, where the site of each zinc atom. So on that basis, even if the Ambergau-Karbaratov equation is not valid under these circumstances, this is still an image of the pair density based on empirical logical analysis um, uh, of the experiment. Beyond that, we don't have a microscopic theory for what's happening in the cuprates. And it would be lovely to do this experiment in another cuprate. We're gearing up to do that right now. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. Um, yes, yeah, Samuel. So I, I have a, a question on my side. So can you use this uh, um, some STM to image orbital selective superconductivity? Uh -huh. Good question. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So let me share screen again. And go forward here. So, so this beautiful experiment here is by Milan Allen's group in Leiden. And they imaged, um, they used Can Josephson imaging in Leiden to image iron selenide telluride. So as a technical statement, um, is it technically possible? Well, the answer is yes. Milan has already done it. But this is an orbital selective superconductor. Aren't selling. Now, but what did he find? And this is an important piece of physics that people have not paid attention to. He found that iron selenide telluride, which is said to be an exotic topological superconductor, blah, blah, blah. It's actually horribly disordered at the atomic scale because the tellur tellurium substitution on the selenium site damages or destroys the condensate. So the idea that iron selenide telluride is this beautiful homogeneous topological superconductor is just nonsense. And you can see that it's nonsense by looking at Milan's images. Okay, so if I were to do this, if I were to build on his achievements and I hope to do so, I would go back to pure iron selenide and attempt to visualize the orbital selective Cooper pairs in that compound. I imagine we'd need an iron selenide tip, but now we're going into unknown territory, so we're not sure how to do that experiment. All right, thanks, thanks a lot for your response. So uh, I think that if there are no further questions, we can stop the official part Great. Of, of the colloquium. So first of all, thank you, Samuel, for this uh, wonderful talk and for showing us all this. Uh, can, I, really... can I ask one last question? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Well, um, uh, have you looked at the uh, pair density modulation uh, near magnetic sites or any pair breaking sites just to verify uh, how it actually should behave right. in general before going into a cuprate? Oh, before going into the cuprate. Well, zinc is a pair breaking site in the cuprates. Okay. Uh, but so we have done that experiment in the cuprates. We haven't done it in the transition metal dichalcogenide. So that's why I said in my summing up, there are wonderful opportunities for future physics. Somebody should make niobium diselenide with iron impurities and do the same experiment. I think it would be extremely interesting. But yeah. I, haven't, I haven't done it. I don't know. I mean, it, it would be definitely a great uh, idea. I mean, maybe far-fetched, but even about entanglement uh, in the future, perhaps. Yeah, um, th 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 this, is, this is a new universe. I think yeah. uh, many of the things we have, mm -hmm. for so many years, we could only see the quasiparticles. People started to think the quasiparticle is the superconductor, but that's nonsense, right? The quasiparticle is a useful signature of the superconductor. But the super is the thing I showed you today. So now that world becomes visual to us. And I believe there is a great deal of promise for the future. Thank you very much for the talk. Sure. Yes, great. So let's uh, close down the official part of the colloquium today. So All right. again, thank you very much and uh, for the wonderful talk. And thank you, everybody, for joining today's talk. Hi, Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, and the, the next colloquium will be in two weeks from now and it will be given by uh, Una Kim. So we look forward to see you then and uh, have a nice week. All right. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.